history of the New York Rangers is brought to you by Sharp Electronics Corporation, a proud sponsor of New York Rangers hockey. Body shields, helmets, and gauntlets with razor sharp blades strapped on their feet and carrying long swords of hardwood. These modern day warriors prepare to do battle with their worthy foe. In a world of team sports where competition is often likened to war, the ultimate goal is and always will be winning. And the hope that springs in the soul of every loyal hockey fan is the sight and sound of their home team circling the rink and holding aloft the symbol of that ultimate victory, the Stanley Cup. This is the story of one such long campaign driven by that hope and underscored by tumultuous victory, crushing defeat, and a dream that wouldn't die. It's the story of a very special team. At its best, among the proudest. At its worst, held together by a rare breed of loyalty and pride, gifted from the grassroots of an arena called Madison Square Garden. This is the story of New York Ranger hockey and of those supporters who will never let their dream wither away. New York Ranger hockey fans. of the 1920s was aggressively colorful. Gentleman Jimmy Walker ran City Hall, while the less gentle Legs Diamond and Dutch Schultz ran much of the rest of the town. Prohibition was on, but everyone made the best of a bad situation. The taverns may have gone underground, but the rail system hadn't, and the L gave sports fans a quick five-cent route over the traffic. This is where it all began, Madison Square Garden, 1925. Located on 8th Avenue and 50th Street, it was then called the most famous of sports arenas. The first professional sports to bask in its glory were championship boxing and the flourishing sport of six-day bike races. NHL hockey was just a novelty imported from the north. The New York Americans, formerly a Hamilton, Ontario franchise in financial trouble, came to town as the Garden's official opening event and were an instant success. The president of the Garden, Tex Rickard, a boxing promoter, thought he saw a future in the sport, not to mention a profit, and set about finding a franchise of his own. 
by a stroke of good luck and bad fortune, the Western Canada Hockey League had just melted away, and a group of excellent professional players became available to join the three new National Hockey League expansion teams. The Chicago Blackhawks, seen here, the Detroit Cougars, and the New York Rangers. 1926, the heyday of the flapper, their dance was the Charleston, and their screen idol was Rudolph Valentino. His funeral that year brought out thousands of fans. A lot more funerals came from a dispute in the Speakeasy's distribution network. The Rangers made their debut at the Garden November 16, 1926 against the Montreal Maroons, the 1925-26 Stanley Cup champions. They were named for Tex Records, Texas Rangers. The very first Rangers signed to a contract was Murray Murdoch. He is also one of the last original Rangers left. The first team in New York, of course, was the Americans, and it went over so well that the Garden decided that they wanted a team, and the commission, John, Colonel John S. Hammond, to gather a team, and he picked Connie Smythe as his coach. He had to pick a nucleus of pros. Connie picked Bun Cook and Bill Cook. And when he had those, he asked them who they'd like for a centerman. And they said they'd like Frank Boucher. Then Connie more or less took over, and he picked on for defense Ching Johnson, who was a well-established amateur, and Taffy Abel, Clarence was his name, so he went by the name of Taffy. That was your nucleus of your team, Chabot and Goal, Ching Johnson, and Taffy Abel on defense, and the one experienced forward line from the old Western Canada League, Boucher had played in Vancouver and uh, they became the nucleus of a winning team. The Maroons, who may have won their name by marooning any team they happened upon, ran aground in the garden that night, losing one to nothing. And so began the Ranger legend. When the expansion team Rangers defeated the reigning champions, the rest of the league sat up and took notice. On the other hand, their coach, Con Smythe, had already stood up and taken his lead. After his exit, Smythe went back to Toronto and formed the Maple Leafs. The rest, as they say, you could look up. Before the Rangers played their first game, Smythe was succeeded by Lester Patrick. Lester had been a professional coach and won the Stanley Cup with the Victoria Cougars of the Western Canadian League in 1924-25. Patrick, with the club Smytheville, was a huge success. His team went on to prove that their opening night win against the Maroons was a harbinger of things to come. He never had to have anything writing with Lester Patrick. His word was as good as, as gold. If he said that you, if you did a certain thing and uh, scored a certain number of goals or something like that, that there was a bonus in for it, you never had to have it in writing. Always thinking again, uh, thinking of the good of the game and uh, just lived hockey. Known as the Silver Fox, he was an outstanding player and was credited as the first defenseman to carry the puck into the forward zone and score a goal. He became a gifted coach and teacher, the first to substitute entire lines instead of individual players. The first line did as they liked, the second line did as told, and the third line was damn lucky to be there. Now, another thing that I do remember about Lester, if you won more games than you lost, he wasn't looking to replace anybody on the team. But if you ever were to lose more than you won, then nobody's job was secure. And that philosophy led to a great team spirit. In the 1927-28 season, the year-old expansion team skated to a 1916-9 record and went into the playoffs against Pittsburgh, Boston, and then the Montreal Maroons. Patrick even made a dramatic return as a player in the finals at the age of 44 to help the Rangers win their first Stanley Cup. The former playing great was about to contribute to his legend. Here in his own words, he describes the moment. Some of the players started to say, well, let's see you go in. I said, oh, no, I don't want to go in. And finally, I donned Mr. Chabot's uniform and skates and so forth. Everything fit me like a glove except the skates and shoes, which were a size or so too large. When the game proceeded, and as luck would have it, the boys went all out and gave everything that they had to protect me. 
and we won with the extra goal in overtime. It was an outstanding end to the season and an equally astounding beginning. A year-old upstart expansion club, with the help of a coach who had been retired for years, had beaten the NHL's best. Try as they might, few athletes in New York could top that act. The 1920s were gathering to a roaring end, and so were the Rangers. They made the playoffs every year, and although disaster came for the rest of the country with a crash of 29, Patrick skated the team into the dirty 30s, a clear winner. As the country drew near one of its darkest hours, FDR took the helm in Washington in 1932. He promised a new deal. Lester Patrick, already at the helm of the New York Rangers, was more interested in the status quo, winning hockey. The team he assembled for the 1932-33 season was at once big and bruising, small and quick, dominant defensively and offensively explosive. Earl Siebert and Ott Heller joined Ching Johnson on defense and quickly mastered Ching's version of the teeth-rattling body check. While the Ranger defensemen formed a rear guard in the era's defensive style of play, the Cook-Boucher-Cook line worked the boards till the puck rolled free. When it came to finesse, they lacked nothing. When it came to force, they weren't lacking much either. Finesse or force, it all added up to goals. Bill Cook led the NHL in scoring, as he had the previous year, while Frank and Bunn finished second and fourth respectively in their division. The Rangers continued to win and their following grew while fans at home listened to a young Foster Hewitt. What do you say we go down to the Ranger dressing room and see the team and also meet their famous coach, Lester Patrick? We bring you that broadcast on this rare piece of film. Hey, uh, Lester, how is hockey going over in the United States? Well, Foster, I uh, tell you, the, it's remarkable the way the game of hockey has been accepted into the hearts of the great American centers. And I honestly believe that his possibilities have merely been scratched. Well, uh, certainly the Rangers have increased the popularity of the game in New York. How would you really rate the Rangers of this year with other years? Well, in my opinion, the Rangers team of 1932-33 is the most crowd-pleasing, colorful, and polished machine that's ever been my pleasure to handle. That's quite a tribute. I guess I'll see Ching Johnson now. Yes, Ching is just around the corner. <laughs> Uh, what's the hardest series you've been in in the playoffs? Well, I think the series of 1928 was the Montreal Maroons, the hardest series I've ever in. It's certainly a veteran of veteran. I believe you've been picked on the all-star team for three years, is it? Which uh, city would you sooner play in? Well, I think I'd rather play in Montreal than any city. Where are those cooks? We'll have to find them. Uh, they're back here in the corner. These two cooks still together. You know, it's amazing to hockey fans how, that you, how you can work together the way you do. How do you really do it? Well, we get along pretty well together, being brothers. We played together for 11 years, uh, six years before we came to the New York Rangers, and uh, since then, uh, we've got along wonderfully well. Uh, Phil, surely you have a few hints to the younger hockey players, you know, how you drill them in there and have led the league so many times. Couldn't you give the uh, youngsters just a few tips how to put them in there? Well, the only thing I can say to the youngsters coming up is to uh, put the puck where the goal's hand there is. There's the bell, boys. Come on, last period. That's all I have to go to work. Last period, boys. After sweeping the Canadians and the Red Wings in the playoffs, the Rangers met Toronto in the finals. At least they met what was left of Toronto, who had just come out of the longest game in NHL history at that time, eliminating the Bruins in the 104th minute of overtime. Foster Hewitt calls the action. And one minute to go, Bill took at center ice over the blue line, after the defense of the Rangers keep right on coming in and close, but it was wide of the net. 
Red Horner leads the dangerous right for Toronto. They're closing right in on the defense. The withered Leafs fell under the awesome power of the Ranger attack and were dispatched three games to one. The final victory coming predictably off the stick of Bill Cook. The way the team had been playing, it had been a predictable Stanley Cup. Here, at the roots of Ranger tradition, Cook and his teammates had become athletic idols among the fabled few in New York sports who could consistently bring home world championships, a force to be reckoned with in the league. The city wildly celebrated this, the ultimate victory, and the Rangers' eighth anniversary. The rest of the country celebrated the repeal of the 18th Amendment. But for America, a drought was on the way. And not far behind it, the Rangers would run dry. The mid-1930s began the era of the crooner, and the Rangers were still a symphony of sweet music. They played to packed houses, and oh, how they played. Neil Colville teamed with his brother Mac and Alex Shibiki, playing center on a line modeled after the Cook-Boucher-Cook combination of earlier years. Brian Hextall was a right winger with a hard shot. His bone-crushing style of play kept opponents on their backs, and that kept Garden fans on the edge of their seats. Lynn Patrick, Lester's oldest son, played on the left wing, having to endure the derisive nickname Sonia because his skating style reminded someone of Olympic star Sonia Henney. Muzz Patrick, Lynn's brother, was an all-round athlete, but his formidable presence on defense might have had something to do with the fact that he was also a former Canadian amateur heavyweight boxing champion. And somewhere along the line, Frank Boucher won the Lady Bing Trophy so often, the league finally let him keep it. The Ranger farm system had delivered up a bumper crop of rookies, combined with some astute trades and acquisitions. The high-flying Broadway blues became the apple in the Big Apple's eye. Here for Montreal, they rolled out a good old-fashioned New York welcome to the strains of Gladys Gooding's favorite song. Good night, good night, good night. The 39 World's Fair brought everyone a little closer for a moment, even though the world was very close to blowing apart. Frank Boucher began another great Ranger tradition by taking the helm and making the transition from player to coach. In fact, he changed the game. Boucher, in my opinion, was responsible for making the game of hockey the offensive game it is today. Frank Boucher was responsible for putting the center line into hockey. It used to be you could pass within zones and not outside of the zones. And of course, he put the center line in hockey, which opened up hockey. But Frank was an innovator and a very great hockey man, besides being a very great hockey player. So began the modern era of hockey. The Rangers started the first televised hockey game on sets like this one. But the vast majority of Ranger fans could get a clearer picture on their radios, which otherwise brought mostly bad news about the war in Europe. But in 1940, a final ray of sun broke through when the Rangers again met the Toronto Maple Leafs for the Stanley Cup final. And what would turn out to be the Rangers' final Stanley Cup. In 1940, being a Ranger fan was something special. In those days, loyalty came easy. The team, whether it won the Stanley Cup or not, was acknowledged to be one of the toughest and classiest clubs in the league. Going to the games was a major event. When they began the playoffs that spring, they were a fast, smart, skate-and-shoot team, not unlike the Canadians in their glory years. In that last great championship year, the team put together a winning streak that lasted 19 games. Davy Kerr was the goaltender, and he did his job well enough to win the Vezina Trophy with a goals against average of 1.6, a berth on the All-Star team, and a total of 40 shutouts in seven years. With Phil Watson, Art Coulter, Kilby McDonald, Babe Pratt, Snuffy Smith, Alf Pike, and their fastest skater, Dutch Hiller, the Rangers looked like a hometown hockey fan's dream come true. They looked like the world's best. They were the blues of Broadway, the boys from New York, and anywhere they went in North America, they could fill the arena and trounce the home team. And when they came back to the Garden, they made the heroic moments that burned that season into our memory. 1940. The year we took it all. The year we took our lumps and bruises and stitches until the only thing left to take was the prize. When Hextall drove home the winning goal in overtime in Toronto, 
it seemed as though the boys who delivered the championship would rise to the occasion off times again. Before that Stanley Cup in 1940, New York Ranger pride was a torch that had been kindled on the ice. After that cup, the torch and the pride were kept burning in the stands. Although the Rangers came out of the 30s drinking from the Stanley Cup and riding on a great wave of approval, the tide was about to turn. For all of America, the favorite pastime was swing. Sinatra crooned and the Bobby Soxers swooned. Even the Rangers celebrated with a new victory song written by J. Fred Coots, the composer of Love Letters in the Sand. But while everyone was singing and dancing, the Nazi war machine swung into action and went on the march. The war was on and suddenly we were in it. America hoped for the best and prepared for the worst. Canadian and American men and women and their heroes lined up to fight. Among those heroes were the champion New York Rangers. The trials and tribulations of a professional hockey team are little to compare with the horrors this world war brought on us. But in a very real sense, one of the early casualties of the conflict were the Rangers. Having lost their best players over the next four seasons, they languished in the cellar. And on one terrible night in Detroit in January of 1944, they suffered a 15 to nothing defeat that made the record books in four places. After the Rangers won the Stanley Cup, in 1940, of course, in the early 40s, the war years came along, and the whole of the National Hockey League was shook up. You had better teams in the Canadian Air Force and the Canadian Army than you had in the National Hockey League. During the war, the Rangers were hit very, very hard, and I can remember a season in the very late 40s where the Rangers won very, very few hockey games and it was a very very sad era and the only sad era actually in ranger history but the rangers did have some truly outstanding players that stayed home keeping the team together among them was future hall of famer chuck rayner charlie rayner was a great goaltender charlie rayner carried the rangers Charlie Rayner almost won the Stanley Cup for the Rangers in 1950. He was a great Ranger and certainly deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Bones Rowley, by the way, a very young Ranger at the time, I think he was 17 when he became a Ranger, but he was all Ranger hot. His body wasn't hardly big enough to hold it. Edgar Lepard was a fancy Dan, and Edgar Lepard uh, came to the Rangers, and I believe his brother came at uh, the time with Edgar, but Edgar was the hockey player, a fancy Dan, could do tricks with the puck, and a pretty fair country hockey player. Even with those stars, Hockey Night at the Garden became synonymous with unrelenting humiliation. Unrelenting because win or lose, the faithful still came out. It was to be a quarter century of misery. Between 1942 and 1967, the team missed the playoffs 18 times. Ten times they wound up fifth in a 16 league. Eight times they finished dead last. But in the 49-50 season, with Lynn Patrick now coaching, the fourth place Rangers shocked everyone by reaching the cup finals against Detroit, playing in Toronto because the circus had displaced them from the garden. The Blues took a 3-2 lead over the dynasty-bound Red Wings. Rangers have won the last two games in the series on a pair of spectacular overtime goals by Don Raleigh. Jerry Couture is knocked down. Nick McCoskey passes to Kalita. Kalita to Alan Stanley who scores! Rangers lead one to nothing and only need to win this game to win the Stanley Cup. But Detroit fought back as Sid Abel scores and the series is tied 3-3. Announcer Doug Smith calls the action of the seventh and deciding game. Chips are really down now in this first All-American Stanley Cup final in seven years. With Marty Pavlich in the penalty box, the Rangers scored two goals in 64 seconds to jump into a two-goal lead. Alan Stanley and Tony Leswick were the marksmen. In the second period, with Stanley of New York in the box, the Red Wings tied the score with two goals just 21 seconds apart. Pete Babando and Sid Abel pulling the trigger. Then Buddy O'Connor scored for New York, and Jimmy McFadden tied it up again with a Detroit goal. A scoreless 
third period is called as overtime period, and eight minutes into the second overtime, set the stage for intense sports drama. The puck comes back to Pete Babando. He shoots. Babando scores. The game is over after 28 minutes and 31 seconds of overtime. The Detroit Red Wings win the Stanley Cup from the New York Rangers in the seventh and deciding game. This has been one of the hardest fought Stanley Cup. It was a heartbreaking defeat but it proved that the Rangers could still hang tough with the best the league had to offer. They were good enough to come within one goal of the Stanley Cup. That memory would have to sustain the fans for the next decade. The 50s have always been looked on as a simpler carefree time, a time when you could walk the dog and not worry about anything it left behind. The best seat in the garden cost 440, and the Blues had no trouble filling them with often blue, but always true fans. But another longer drought was well underway, and the Rangers' 25th anniversary didn't show much hope for producing Stanley Cup silver. Whatever they had lost in stature diminished in importance in 1951 because the Rangers gained a fan club. It was a new base of support, and it couldn't have come at a better time. From all over the city came an outpouring of support, including some weird theories on winning hockey. The Oni's Magic Elixir is one of the great publicity stunts of all time. Uh, the Rangers were very poor in those years, and I'm going to say this would be the early 50s. And uh, Gene Leone was a very famous restaurateur on West 48th Street. It's since moved, and the stunt was quite simple. The Rangers were going terribly, and we're going to give them this magic elixir. It wasn't even wine. It was probably water with some food coloring in it. And they were going to drink this magic potion. It got tremendous space in the New York press. But shortly thereafter, the bottle gave up the Rangers. After a few losses, they wound up on the wagon, and the wagon headed back for the cellar. Somewhere along the way in that long winter of 1952, abuse was added to insult, which had already been added to injury. On the 23rd of March, Bill Mozienko of the Chicago Blackhawks got a hat trick against the Blues, the fastest ever at 21 seconds. That 21 seconds could have been a short history capsulizing a dozen years of frustration and disappointment. The 50s had marked a period of turmoil and conflict. The turmoil came from repeatedly losing a berth in the playoffs to other hockey clubs. The conflict meant losing a berth in Madison Square Garden to other forms of life. At a time when it was popular for a lot of boys to run away and join the circus, the Rangers spent more than 30 years running away from it. Did it finally have an effect? Oh, it had to have a very great effect, and it had to have a, an effect on the Rangers not winning the Stanley Cup after 1940 into the uh, late 50s, I think, when it was possible to change the ice over and make the games. But the Rangers were, you know, lost souls. Fiery Phil Watson was running the team in the late 50s, and he ran them hard. I remember Phil, uh, he's still a good friend of mine, as a coach of the Rangers. He was uh, called Fiery Philippe. He was very Gallic and French-Canadian. I remember most of all about Phil Watson, the time he made the Rangers practice after a game which they had lost at Madison Square Garden. If you can imagine, they lost the game, I think, to the Bruins or the Canadians, I'm not sure. They had to come back out on the ice. Many of the fans stayed. It was a spectacle. A spectacle indeed. For some, those were the days of good, good, good vibrations. But while the Beatles sang Good Day Sunshine, the Rangers seemed frozen, fighting to keep warm deep in the winter of their discontent. But even during the darkest days of the league's cellar dwellers, a few bright stars shone through. Lorne Gump Worsley, totally fearless except when it came to flying. The Gumper was a winning goalie, but for 10 years he was enlisted in a losing cause. Traded to the Canadians, he promptly won the Vezina Trophy and the Stanley Cup. Andy Bathgate was the first of the new era of superstars. His skills put him on the All-Star team seven times and brought him the Hart Trophy as the league's most valuable player. Harry Howell was an all-star and an Iron Man, playing 1160 games, the most in Ranger history. Leapman Louis Fontanato wasn't made of iron, but the way he hit people, you wouldn't know it. Under coaches Doug Harvey, Muzz Patrick, and Red Sullivan, the Rangers wandered into the mid-60s, truly the lost tribe on the quest for the chalice. 
But the 1964 World's Fair came to town, and with spring here, could the cup be far behind? There seemed to be reason for hope. In 1960, a rookie named Gilbert came to the garden. It was like an adopted son uh, right from the beginning here uh, because they, 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 had a sense, they had a sense that I came from, uh, from Canada and I had gotten injured and fought back the injury to, uh, to come back to the Rangers. I was nominated like the best player in junior in Canada and uh, they felt that uh, I would add like a tremendous uh, support to the Rangers. And of course, uh, a lot of the players where I had played, like Andy Bathgate and, and Ari Howell and Dean Prentice came from the same uh, city of Guelph that I had developed and went to school. So they anticipated big things from, uh, from me. And then I started in the playoffs scoring the two goals the first game. So that didn't, that didn't hurt either. Over his career, he was to follow with 404 more. In 61, he was joined by his boyhood friend, Jean Rattel. When I grew up in Montreal at the age of eight years old and nine years old and so on, that's where we started with Jean Rattel and myself uh, playing in the Little League in uh, Canada and Montreal. We actually devoted a lot of time off the ice to, to try to, uh, to understand the game and to read about it more and to watch other players, how they would react in certain circumstances. And uh, it w he was like extremely uh, helpful to me. And, and to, to have started like at such a young age and develop our skills together and knowing each other's moves was a tremendous help for me. Then on February 22, 1964, a momentous trade was announced. Andy Bathgate, the reigning Rangers superstar, was dealt to Toronto for five players, including Arnie Brown, Bob Nevin, and Rod Sealing. GM Muzz Patrick and Ranger President Bill Jennings felt they had the core of a new team, and they did. The 64 Rangers were a team on the build. They were stronger, younger. They were entering a period they hadn't seen since the 30s. Good news was on the way. The messenger was Emile Francis. The cat had been a ranger netminder in his playing days, and although small in stature, he was one tough customer. He lost 18 of his teeth, none of which died of old age. His nose had been broken five times, and he'd taken over 200 stitches in his face. Perhaps Francis became the man who led the ranger resurrection because he had so much of two basics it takes to play great hockey, heart and guts. Come on, Peter, go in. The way to come back now, same way now, every line. No way to move it, that's the way to move it there, boy. Come on, that's the idea. No way to jump on him, that's the way to move in. Get him, get him, piece of that guy, come in. Under Francis, they came very close to winning more games than they lost. Somewhere, Lester Patrick was smiling. Emil Francis, uh, as a leader, uh, as you can tell, was probably one of the most important person to have make hockey progress uh, in the United States. And the, the time that he was with me was, I was only like 18 years old, uh, playing in Guelph, and he came to coach me. And the understanding that we had developed um, it showed me like a tremendous uh, leader and a, a person that uh, understood the game very well and uh, demanded a, a discipline that was, uh, that was very important, uh, especially if you did play in New for the New York Rangers here. Over on the right side, Lawrence. Get over on the left side, Abby. Here, Waller. Okay, two up at a time, forwards and backwards. Okay, just stay within the blue line. See how long you can hold on to the puck for. Rod, you start her off. John, just carry the puck yourself and on your backhand. During that time, the whole league got younger. Expansion brought in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Minnesota, and Oakland. New blood flowed into the old NHL, and the old guard who would serve so well bowed out. And also in honor of Harry Howell Knight, Johnny Busick, captain of the Boston Bruins, is a special presentation from the Bruins. Harry... On behalf of the Boston Bruins organization, I want to congratulate you on your 1,000th game, participating in your 15th year. Even though you're getting a little older and a little grayer on top, I know you'll be around for another 15. But within a year, both Howell and the arena retired. With the closing of the old garden, an era drifted into history. Gone were the columns that had obscured the action on the ice. Although those columns were something New York high school kids hardly noticed, since their geocards had won them a discount to the balcony, the best view in the house.
This was a team that really had a history, and the memories came back with an evening of old familiar faces. Rayner, Boucher, Red Sullivan, Leap and Louis Fontanato, and Camille the Eel Henry all gathered to commemorate the opening of the new garden. On February 19, 1968, the fourth garden opened with the Rangers facing off against the Flyers. Emile's boys blew into the garden on a breeze that carried a scent the fans weren't used to, the sweet smell of victory. Here was another Ranger tradition, a new beginning with a new team, as the poet Tennyson said, and every winter turns to spring. On that line alone, Tennyson could have been president of the Ranger fan club. are the greatest fans in the world. It is, anybody can be chief, anybody can be chief. They had very, very special fans here. Like the, the nucleus of fans that came from Brooklyn and Long Island and New Jersey were the most ardent fans of any sports. So therefore the pride of the Rangers uh, was instilled in the players and we received that immediately when we came to New York. If you're not a loyal Ranger fan, you're not a Ranger fan. Sit here, go through every piece of emotion, and you know what more? What more can you say than that? You have to be a Ranger fan. You have to sit here in the blue section. You have to enjoy life, being with the best fans in the world. Who sit in the blue section? I might add. <laughs> and you have to be like a person like me. In the early 60s, the goal a game line was born and gave the fans three good reasons to cheer. Although their names spelled like it sounded gay, the opposition didn't find them amusing. They were a promise of better times, winning times. Their centerman was Jean Rattel. He was a player's player whose great swiftness of foot was matched by swiftness at reading the ebb and flow of the game. He had skills in rare combination, flashy and steady. Well, John Rattel, often on the ice, he's basically the same. He never changes. Whether he has a good game or a bad game, his personality uh, never differs. He, uh, on the ice, he is a tremendous uh, centerman, a very slick hockey player, handles the puck very well, sets up the plays, uh, really controls the game when he's on the ice. Well, Roger Bear has been uh, my uh, line mate for over 20 years now, so uh, I couldn't say enough for Rod. It just, uh, it's just been a pleasure to play with him all these years, even when I was uh, 12 years old playing in minor leagues. These few seconds are testimony to the style of hockey Ranger fans had come to expect. This young man was the epitome of Ranger style. His commitment, his energy, and his talent helped make Hockey Night at the Garden spectacular. It was after like a number of, uh, of years that uh, we had tried different left wingers uh, to, to compliment Jean Rattel and myself. And um, it, just, it just seemed like to, to fit right in, like Vic Hadfield's style of um, digging into the corners and, and to, uh, to be the leader of that particular line. And the three of us uh, complimented each other because we were basically very serious about knowing the game and improving ourselves. The gag line night after night drove home the goals, and in the company of some outstanding talent, including a 28-year-old minor league goalie, Eddie Jockerman, they helped bring winning hockey home to the garden. The 60s drew to a close with giant leaps and small steps for mankind, but the momentous moves in Madison Square Garden seemed to happen around and inside a thin red line called the crease. Jockerman was a rover, a third defenseman. His shaky start and unusual style made him a target of abuse, but to watch him was to love him, and he soon became an object of great affection. His alter ego, Gilles Villemure, sometimes looked like his mirror image. Together they were magnificent, and together, night after night, what they did to some of the game's greats was plain robbery. Well, Jill Villamere, I think, way down deep in my heart, his first love was horses. But 
What made it so special for him was he happened to have a guy that liked to play an awful lot, and he kind of liked the not-so-much-pressure type games because he wanted to devote more time to studying the racing form. And because of that, we were unique because we were a good team. Uh, I caught with my left hand, he caught with his right hand, and so any time an opposition played against us, they kind of forgot who was in goal. And we complimented each other so much that uh, I, I think it was probably one of the greatest tandems to play in the National Hockey League. And, and I was elated when we both shared winning the Vesna Trophy because it's a dream every goalie wants to do, and, and we were fortunate enough to do it. This smiling lad is the immensely talented Brad Park cornerstone of that ranger defense an excellent stick handler his forte was clearing and rushing the puck he was considered the number two defenseman in the league next to bobby orr and he was named to the all-star team six times right next to bobby orr while park was cutting a swath through the league the big strong high scoring center walter kachuk teamed with wingman bill fairburn to reign as the league's best defensive forwards killing penalties, and with them, opposing power lines, chances to score. The fans seem to recognize something in this team. Do we dare to believe it? Could it be the cup? This Ranger team had remarkable depth, with 40 goal scorer Steve Vickers, big fast Jim Nielsen, scrappy Glenn Sather, and veterans like Dave Ballone. The Rangers not only had some of the best defensive capabilities in the league, they had the best offense to offer too. There were even a few guys who came forward in times of great need. They were there in the clutch. Now Horton starts out. We're a minute 20 into overtime period three. Horton to center for the red line. He slaps wide right side of us. We see the rebound. Irvin shoots. There, there. In the third period of overtime, Pete Stemkowski wrapped home a pass that capped a memorable night and a magnificent drive for the cup. Stemkowski had won his place in Ranger lore. If there ever was an instant sign of recognition between two Ranger fans, it has to be, remember Stemmer's goal? In the 72 season, the good times had come, it seemed for good. The gag line became the only trio in hockey to hold down three of the league's top five scoring spots. Vic Hatfield became the only Ranger in history to score 50 goals. Jean Rattel became the first Ranger to score 100 points before an injury shortened his season. In the finals that year, the Rangers faced off against Boston and scored the first goal. It looked too good to be true, and it was. The Blues were up against Phil Esposito, one of the greatest scorers of all time at the peak of his career. They were also up against a Bruins club at its peak, a club that had set a record for total points in the season. It dominated, if not intimidated, the league with a hard-nosed, hard-checking style of play. If that wasn't enough, they also had to contend with Bobby Orr, one of the greatest players of all time at the peak of his career. Those peaks, strive though they might, the Rangers could not skate. The tide, it seemed, had turned against them. And as the current carrying the puck trickled by the valiant Villemur and his mates, it carried the prize with it. But even in defeat, the Rangers remained strong. The victory on that particular night belonged to someone else. And although the cup went around the rink in the wrong hands, the Ranger revival and the winning hockey it brought lasted nine years. It had rekindled a flame that had grown dim in the late 50s. Its beginnings in the early to mid-60s weren't clearly defined in any one moment. It was a gathering and shaping of players with skills that evoked memories of the Ranger teams of old. But perhaps the era was mortally wounded in 1975 with a sudden and shocking defeat at the hands of the upstart Islanders. It was a terrible moment and lives here on a rare piece of film that seems to want, like the memory, to fade away. Eleven seconds into overtime, Ju Drouin passed to J.P. Parisi, who was parked in front of the Rangers' net, and he made no mistake. It was a crushing blow to those who had fought so long and so well. 
but maybe that era really died and gave birth to something bigger. One weekend on October 31st 30. of 75, uh, when I was told to uh, come to Long Island, Long Beach, Long Island, to uh, meet Emil Francis that evening. It was a Friday night. It was Halloween night. And uh, what happened that evening was I was told then that I was no longer a New York Ranger, that I was put on waivers and Detroit had claimed me. And the two of us sat down and I explained to him, like, you know, uh, where he'd been, where we had been, where we were going, and what I had to do as far as uh, developing a goalkeeper. And uh, I knew that, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for him. And I probably never admitted to now, but it wasn't easy for me because uh, I liked that Jockman. I found out about it, as did most of the other writers. The Rangers had already left for a game in Montreal, and he was not with them. Uh, and he took it very hard. He was very emotional about it at first. I recall getting a telephone call from Alex Del Vecchio, then the Detroit Red Wings general manager. He had been unable to contact Eddie. He knew he was quite emotionally upset. Wasn't certain if he would report to the team. And when he did find out that Eddie would be there, I recall him asking me, he said, you know Eddie fairly well. It could be too emotional for him, but you think he'd be willing to play against the Rangers Sunday. The New York Ranger fans knew Eddie Jackman better than Eddie Jackman knew himself because they knew I was going to play that game. But I didn't know I was going to play that game. Up until 5.30 that night, I was sitting in the hotel room waiting for Detroit to come to town just to have a word with them to find out. And they already had me penciled out that I was not going to play. What happened that evening when I came on the ice was unbelievable. Eddie was gone, but he was far from forgotten. In that one incredible night, the fans in Madison Square Garden showed an athlete something rare, a view of himself and with it a view of themselves that no player or fan of any game in any arena has had the privilege of seeing before or since. Strong men cried that night, and their tears anointed a rite of passage. Eddie Jockerman and the fans became one, and the Rangers in the seats told a Ranger on the ice, you're not beaten, you've won, and neither of us will ever surrender to defeat again. What they did for me was look what you do for honoring an athlete who played a long, long time and you give him a night. Well, that night was Eddie Jackman night. And it was a spontaneous reaction from the fans and it's something that I'll never forget because they not only cheered us in the few moments, but they cheered us the whole game. As it turned out, the Detroit Wind Wings won the game 6-4. And it was a night, again, that I will never forget. The unofficial Eddie Jockman night gave definition to the meaning of Ranger pride. But as it goes with all sports, and especially with the Rangers, there is no gain that comes without pain. Two more great athletes and fan favorites, Brad Park and Jean Rattel, have been traded to the arch-rival Boston Bruins. Very painful. But the Blues gained Carol Vadney and Phil Esposito, and the hurt subsided for some. When I got traded in 75, it was the biggest shock of my life. It was the biggest hurt I have ever had in my life, including my both parents dying and a divorce. So I think that puts in perspective exactly how I felt. I mean, that hurt. It hurt me a lot. And it took me over a year and a half to really believe that I was a New York Ranger. And it took me two and a half years to win over the fans. It did. I know it did. I mean, the people hated me. And I really didn't like them. And it was very, very tough times for me. But I got through it. Phil was renowned as the greatest goal scorer of his time, and the skill he brought to the Rangers on the ice was more than matched by his positive attitude. He was a winner, and he had no intention of giving it up. Phil Esposito, if there's anybody I respect in hockey uh, more, I don't know right now. And if somebody could put the puck in, he was the guy to put the puck in. And uh, what a superman, and he'll do anything for anybody, and he's got a heart the size of Manhattan. In January 1976, a man who had figured in many Ranger defeats began an effort to bring them victory. Montreal's John Ferguson became coach and GM. In that year, the country jubilantly celebrated its 200th birthday, and the Rangers celebrated their 50th with all the enthusiasm they could muster. The club soon followed with new uniforms and reinvented an age-old Ranger tradition looking to the future. But back to pain and gain. 
Espo would have to continue without the invaluable services of one Rodri, Gabriel Gilbert. His whole professional life was New York Ranger, and based on the hearts he won and the records he set, he was one of the greatest Rangers of them all. You have given me a home, friendship, respect, and love. These are the things that consider more important than fame, and for which I will always be grateful to you. But Ranger Hockey soon took a turn toward the fundamental style of Fred Shiro. Fred Shiro knew how to win. Even better, he had that rare ability to teach winning hockey. His Philadelphia Flyers had won four division titles and two Stanley Cups. If there was a championship in the Rangers' near future, it seemed Fred Shiro could find the path to it. But the road to the Stanley Cup is paved with ice. And ice, as anyone who's tried to make a living on it will tell you, is the stuff that sank the Titanic. But the team gained new blood from a virtually untapped pool of talent. The European hockey players, by way of the faltering WHA. Anders Hedberg and Ulf Nielsen were part of a new breed of player, which was really an offshoot of the early New York Rangers. European hockey was all skate, pass and shoot, a style not unfamiliar to the Rangers of the 30s. These new players could skate and shoot with the best. They'd been the highest scorers in the WHA. They were given a hero's welcome and earned it until one terrible night in February, recalled here by a Ranger fan favorite. For a fan who watches a, a Ranger team play, um, they want, they're so supportive, they want their team to win a Stanley Cup and they want them, they want them to do very well. I uh, came along and uh, the incident with Ulf Nielsen was something that was probably placed in one category and I would have been disliked by the Ranger fans for that reason. I do remember him going wide in the corner and at one point I was just coming in to take him out and uh, at that point he made a pivot as I knew uh, he did often. So you basically just try and line him up so he doesn't get around you and when I made contact shoulder to shoulder. Uh, I also heard something that was very unusual and then when he went down I uh, saw immediately that his foot had been caught in a rut but as things went on the Islanders uh, and I was captain of the Islanders we went on to win four Stanley Cup that really irritated and added to the frustration now I think as a Ranger fan they could they could really focus on Dennis Potvin and just let him have it and somehow it worked better and there are things that happened in my private life that gave them fuel to now try and get under my skin. And I think that I was a symbol, but for a time afterwards, it became more than that. I was more than a symbol. I was, I was really a, the target that everyone could focus on. And if anything, uh, the Rangers can be credited for is having fans that could unite for one particular reason. After two months, Nielsen tried a comeback. The team was floundering, but they made the playoffs. The Rangers in that year of 1979 seemed to own the playoffs. Miracles seemed to come along for about a dime a dozen. The Rangers beat L.A. The Rangers beat Philly. The New York Rangers even got even with the division champion Islanders. At last, it seemed they would fulfill all the promise they had shown and all the promises that had been made on their behalf. The 1978-79 season ended with victory, but not the ultimate victory. To some, it seemed as though the Rangers would never again be a team in the New York tradition. New York teams, after all, were champions. New York Rangers select from Ostersund, Sweden, Berlin. The new decade brought the Rangers new management. Craig Patrick, grandson of Lester, son of Lynn, was made director of operations, and the rebuilding was once again underway. By the following year, he announced the signing of Herb Brooks, a former associate and coach of the Miracle Gold Medal U.S. Olympic team. Brooks added Mark Pavlich from his Olympic squad, along with 50-goal scorer Pierre LaRouche, to a team with an astounding array of talents. Perennial Ranger Ron Greshner, the aggressive Barry Beck, and fan favorite Mick Fatiu. But while the Rangers went to the playoffs for five years, the only miracles taking place were happening across the East River on Long Island, and Herb Brooks was soon gone. 
Then, after five years of calling the game in the broadcast booth, Espo got an opportunity to run the game from behind the bench. By the way, I want you guys to know that goal, you did the perfect thing. You went to draw, you head for the net. But you two guys made that play happen. You by going for the net, you by going out. Way to go. What a... In 1986, Phil Esposito was hired as GM of the Rangers. He was given a mandate to rebuild the club and remake it into a Stanley Cup winner. He pictures that moment. That moment will be uh, combined with tremendous amount of joy, a tremend tremendous amount of pride, um, and a tremendous amount of sadness, because I think it'll be my last time uh, in hockey. I think I'll get out. Esposito seems well on his way toward keeping his objective. His formula is one that has worked for the Rangers before. Bright young stars, Van Beesbrook, Patrick, Leach, and Dahlin, combined with gifted veterans, all brought together with a coach who knows how to win, Michel Bergeron. Every 10 years or so, near the beginning or the end of the decade, the Rangers have risen toward glory. It happened in the late 20s and early 30s, and it brought two Stanley Cups. It happened in 1940, another cup. 1950, one goal from the cup. 71-72, record years. 1979, down to the finals. Here at the beginning of a new decade, the range of fortunes seemed to be cresting in the ebb and flow of failed dreams and success beyond wildest hopes. We've seen some of the game's greatest, and now we've come to another season, another spring, and that eternal maybe. Maybe this year, maybe this year, the Cup will finally come back home again to Madison Square Garden.